Uh, Adam is a software engineer from Red Hat, and he's come to talk to you about uh, DinFlow. Apparently, he rides a motorcycle. He's got a 500. I bought a 500 about a year or two ago, so I'm in that in that danger group. But uh, as long as he doesn't die, he's going to come back next year and give us more talks, maybe. So please give me a large round of applause, Adam. All right. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, the title of this talk is. Oh, sorry about this. Uh, the title of the talk is Dynflow, orchestration for your Ruby project. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, be Ruby. Like, Dynflow is, but your project doesn't have to be. Uh, a bit about me. As you already heard, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I joined Red Hat around five and something years ago. And Dynflow was actually the first thing I worked on. I joined as an intern, and they were, I was just thrown into this, and I tried to make some sense from it. I must admit, I'm not the original author. Uh, when I joined Red Hat, it was already ongoing, and both of the original authors already moved on. So now it's up to me and Andre in the audience to maintain it. Uh, I am Adam Ruzicka on GitHub, Aruzitska on Freenode, in case you want to get in touch over IRC, or underscore Aarus underscore on Twitter. Now, what you will see in this talk? We will, we will take a look at what it is. We will take a look at why it was created in the first place. We will introduce a demo project I will be implementing during this talk. We will take a look at the basic building blocks of Dynflow because it has several concepts which can be confusing when you don't really know what they are. Then we will take a look at the high-level deployment. Whoops, what just happened? Okay. Resume presentation. <clears throat> Next, we'll take a look at common patterns used in Dynflow. And this will be probably the biggest part of the talk. It will be the one where I will be sitting at my computer and typing stuff. And you will all be able to see how bad I am at this when someone is watching me. Then we will quickly go over some other cool things which Dynflow can do, but uh, we probably have time to go over them fully. Because if I did that, the talk would be like five hours long. Then we will take a look at the more depth into how it can be deployed. And at the end, we will have questions and answers. So what? What is it? Please raise your hands, whoever heard of Dynflow before coming to this talk. Okay, one, two, but those are foreman guys, those don't count. And one of them is the other maintainer, so yeah, <laughs> okay. So the official site says that Dynflow is a workflow engine written in Ruby. Usually when I tell people this, they don't really know what to expect. So I tend to say that it's smart background processing engine but not really a background processing engine. Uh, the smart part is it allows you to manage dependencies between the things that have to be run and you can order them and you have better control over what gets run when. That's why I say it's smart. Also, it's not really a background processing engine because if you don't need these dependencies, there are projects which do it better. Like, if you don't need the full force, you could be better off with, I don't know, Sidekick, Rescue, maybe Active Job. Is a solution for when just the pure background processing isn't enough? Like, if all you can, all, if all you need is just, okay, I need to do this one single thing and I need to unblock this thread, then, you know, Dynflow is a bit of an overkill for that. Uh, it is currently used by Foreman and its plugins uh, quite heavily. Okay, now why 
why did we write this thing or why the original authors did? Uh, to be honest, we needed to scratch our itch. The itch was that we were integrating with two other systems which had their own tasking system and an asynchronous API. That means it wasn't like, do this thing and you would get the response, but it was, we told the system to do something and we would get back, okay, I'm tracking this as task X, Y, Z, check later. And then we would have to poll if it is done. And when it was done, we had to trigger something else in the other system and we had to keep those two in sync. That's why this project was written. Yeah, that's it. Uh, additionally, we wanted to have a better insight into what is going on and when, and it delivers, I'd say. Okay, so uh, just an outline of what I will be trying to implement in this talk. It will be a CI-like thing, you know, so uh, if you imagine Travis or uh, GitLab CI, Sometimes some change happens to a repository and then a pipeline is kicked off. So the workflow will be, we will clone a Git repository. We will install dependencies, run some lints, run some tests, optionally uh, build a Docker image, for example. And that's the thing we will be making. It will be using Dimeflow under the hood. Uh, I created a repository, Dimeflow CI, where there's a skeleton of the project with some helpers that I will be using later. And an example project which we will be cloning and testing and linting and whatever. So now the tricky part, uh, the building blocks. Please ignore the action two and the plan run step and finalize step below it. Let's take a look at the action roughly in the center first. The core concept of Dynflow is an action. Action is a recipe how to do a single thing. It may be cloning a Git repository, running a command, building a Docker image, something like that. Uh, the good thing about actions in Dynflow is they can be composed and we can have an action which depends on others. So, for example, if we were implementing a CI, we may have an action representing the entire pipeline, and it would be composed of cloning the repository, installing the dependencies, uh, running tests, and all the following things. Uh, next is probably the execution plan. It's hard to say what to describe first because all the things are interconnected. But the execution plan is a realized action, it's a concrete thing, it's again a quite of kind of recipe, but this time with data. So if action is how to clone a Git repository, then an execution plan is clone a rep uh, Git repository which lives at this URL. So it's the action plus input, so it is able to do the thing it is supposed to do. Now, what are the steps? The steps are runtime units of Dimeflow. So it's the most granular thing that Dimeflow can execute. And they are divided into phases. First phase is the plan phase. That's the one where you're basically creating the execution plan. So during the plan phase, you are preparing how to do the entire action top to bottom. The run steps are then when you take a prepared execution plan and you actually try to perform it. And then in the end there is a finalized phase which can be used to perform cleanup after the action what was done or anything basically you may want to do. Now the same thing in text. So action describes how to do a single thing, it can be composed, uh, it has up to three steps, each is in one phase. There is always one step in plan phase, if the action is in an execution plan, always. With run steps and finalized steps, it doesn't have to be. 
There can be an action which doesn't have a run step, there can be an action which doesn't have a finalized step. It may miss both of those, but it always has a plan step. Now the execution plan is concrete description how the action should be performed. It contains at least one action, usually called entry action. And it can transitively have more actions as children of the entry action. This is what I mentioned when I said that there could be an action representing the entire CI pipeline and it would be composed from different actions. Those different actions would be, in the execution plan, they would be as children of the entry action and that would be it. And finally, the last item, the step, is a unit of execution. It belongs to single phase, so you can't have a plan step in a run phase, it would not really work. And that's it. So let's take this example, how planning might go. Here we have actions one to five, and we are saying, hey, Dimeflow, create for me or plan for me an execution plan to perform action one. So what happens is that an execution plan gets created, a plan step for action one gets created, and then the plan step one gets executed. Inside that uh, plan step, the action can say, okay, I want to have my own run and finalize step scheduled to be executed later in the run or finalize phase, or it can say, I need another action. So in this case, action one could say, okay, I want to have my steps and then I want action two. So what would happen is that action one said, I want my own steps, so the run and finalize steps would be created for it. And then it would say, I want action two. So plan step would be created for action two and it would be executed. So we go, one block to the right, we're inside action two, and action two can say, okay, I want to have my own steps, and then I want action three and action four, and I don't really care in which order, so if you can execute them side by side, I don't care, it's fine by me. And this way it goes through the entire graph, so it goes one, two, three, four, then it backtracks to two, one, and then it goes to five. This is the order in which things would get planned. Now, once the execution plan is ready, it can be executed and that means that we are moving from the plan phase to the run phase. Coincidentally, execution plan has a status. At this point, it gets turned over to running. So in, in the start, it was pending, then it was planning, that it was planned, and now that someone is actually working on it, it's running. And if we planned the actions the way like we did on the previous slide, they would be executed like this. First action one, and action two couldn't be executed until action one is. So action one gets executed, action two gets executed, then action three and four can be executed at once. And then Flow knows how to do that, so it would. And action five would wait until both three and four are executed. So those are the dependencies uh, I talked about. It's really simple and you could probably work around that, make your own solution. But in the wild I've seen execution plans which had, uh, I think the biggest one was 300,000 steps. So if you want to micromanage that by hand, um, good luck to you. But Dimeflow is able to keep up with that. And then, once the run phase is done, we move over to finalize. And in finalize, everything gets executed in the order in which it was planned, one by one. And it runs in a transaction. So either all of these succeed or none. And if it fails some, some way, you know, halfway through, you can just resume it, it will roll back to, to the start of the transaction and it will try it again. Okay, those were the most important concepts in Dimeflow. Uh, I promise if they don't make sense now, 
they will start making more sense when there are examples and you can actually see the real code and what it creates. Now, uh, a bit about high-level deployment. In this talk, I will be using a deployment which looks like this. It's a box, it's a single process. It has a built-in in-memory SQLi database. And it has several worker threads which are hidden. We don't really need to care about them for now. But just bear in mind that this is, you know, the development deployment, let's say. When you're running it in production, it may look more be more like this, where there is a shared database, which is external. It doesn't live inside the downflow processes anymore. And there's a distinction between executors and clients. In downflow terminology, uh, those are worlds. The, uh, the, the executor worlds can do everything. They can plan execution plans, they can run the run phase, they can run the finalized phase, they can do all of that. The clients can only plan the execution plans. That means the clients can prepare what needs to be done and then they have to ask some of the executors to actually do it for them. But don't worry, it's, uh, it's not up to you to do this, you know, prepare and tell. It, it works out of the box on its own. Now, we're getting to the code. So, I mentioned that an action is a recipe, how to do a thing. Now, an example. An action is a Ruby class, which has to inherit it from downflow for those action. And actually, this example is a bit misleading because it's not the simplest action that you can create. So, okay, I'm in the Dynflow CI project and um, I have a run me script which triggers the Dynflow, runs the web console because Dynflow has a web console where you can see what's going on and then it spawns a pry instance so I can interactively interact with that. Uh, so let's do the simplest possible action we can and run it. So let's do class test inherits from Dynflow action. And that's it. You don't need to do anything. And then I can trigger it by calling world.trigger and the name of the class. Boom. Okay, it's planned, running something. Let's look at the Dynflow console to see what it's doing. Okay, slash Dynflow. This is what I was talking about when I said I can't really type when people are, people are watching. Oh. Here we are. This is the Dynflow console. By default, it shows only tasks which aren't stopped. And the one we created ran really quickly. It's already done by now. So we can filter by that. And we can see that it stopped. It was successful. And if we look at the details, uh, you can see that it didn't do much. It had a single plan step, but it really didn't really do anything. It had no run step, it had no finalized step. So uh, you can probably see where this is coming from and what is the mapping between the methods and the things which actually get created. So there is the plan method, which is by default in the Dynflow action class. So since it's already defined in its uh, ancestor, you don't have to define it yourself. Then there's the run, which is what should be done when the run step is run. And then there's finalize, which is obviously what should be run when the finalize is run. Now, uh, inside the plan action, uh, inside the plan method, sorry, you can use either plan self, which would which will make Dynflow create the run and finalize steps for the current action, or you can use plan action to plan other actions. There's this distinction and it will be seen in further examples. And one more thing to notice, 
both run and finalize are optional. That means if you don't define them, and that, that even if you call plan self, there won't be run and finalize steps created for this action. Okay, so let's do our first real action, which actually does something. It will be an action which will create or clone a Git repository. So let's go into lib, dimeflow ci, clone git rb. So it's module, dimeflow ci, class, clone git, and it is inheriting from dimeflow action. How should it look? It should receive a URL to the repository we want to clone. And in the plan, plan phase, it doesn't really have to do anything else. It just has to make sure that it will have its own run and finalize steps. So in plan, it will plan self and pass a hash as an option. Oops. Okay. Next, we need to define the run method and here we can access the actions input. I haven't mentioned this yet but actions have input and output and that's a, a storage which gets serialized and stored in the database An action can use it to pass data between faces. So in here I can use input, uh, it's just a hash and I can use that to access the URL which was originally passed to the plan face and then it was passed on as parameter. So all I need to do is just create a temporary directory. Then I will store path to the directory in the actions output. So the later steps, which will follow like the tests, installing dependencies, will know where the checkout is placed. And the last thing I will do is just run git clone the URL to the directory. Why not? Uh, let's do this as a full example and let's have it have a finalized method as well. And there we will file utils rmrf the checkout. So this action is self-contained, it gets a new URL, it clones the repository somewhere, and when it's done, it removes it. And all that's remaining is to add it in here. Required flow ci slash oh. Okay, clone git. Now we can go over to the console and we can try running it. I have a repository defined as this constant and we can try running the action. So it will be world.trigger dimeflow ci clone git and we'll give it the URL, which is the repo. Okay, and it blew up. <laughs> That's the thing with live demos. Okay, undefined method mktemder Okay, there's an... Okay, this method is called differently. So if we do this again... Okay, success. We can inspect the Dimeflow console and... We can see that it ran. It had the run and the finalized steps. We can see that it was cloned to, into slash tmp slash d2020 something. But if you looked there right now, it wouldn't be there because the entire execution plan is done and in the finalized phase, we removed the directory again. So let's just believe it does what we need it to do for now and move on with the slides. Uh, 
I have several examples here. They are more for like, uh, you know, if what I was doing went terribly wrong. So we will have an action which receives uh, two inputs. One is the directory in which it should run, and the other one is a command it should run. And it changes the working directory to the directory, it runs the command, and that's it. Either it succeeds or not. If it succeeds, we erase an exception and mark the step as failed. Alternatively, there is a different way for changing of the directory. Uh, the way it is right now, it works, it could be done, but let's imagine you had another action which would need to change its working directory as well. Then you would have to duplicate the, the changing of the directory in every single place where you wanted to do it. But uh, Dimeflow allows you to define middlewares which allow you to run pieces of code around execution of steps. So in here I'm declaring a middleware which will change the di working directory and then pass the execution forward to the step. So what's going on here? Uh, it assumes that the action has the directory dir key in its input and when this gets run, the middleware, the middleware takes the directory, changes the current working directory into there and then calls pass, which moves down the middleware stack and calls the next step in there. The next step could be another middleware. You can stack them however you want, or it could be the step, in which case it starts, after the step is done, it starts going up back the stack. So we could, we could use this. And then you have just, you just have to tell the action to use the middleware. So instead of having everywhere the there dot change there or something, you can just do middleware dot use and the class of the middleware and that's it. Now, uh, we define several other actions. We are uh, inheriting from the run command action and just overriding several inputs and so on. So, for example, installing dependencies is just uh, planning self with command bundle install and running it in a given directory. Uh, running tests is basically just a run command and we will pass all the things it needs to it. And then there's build docker, which takes the path, label, and a tag, optionally, and plans self with, again, it's a run command, takes a directory and a command, and it does that. Now, the composition. Uh, we have seen how actions can plan a directions, and that's using the plan action method. Again, it takes the class of the action and then all the parameters. And all the parameters get passed to the plan method of that given class. That's the binding between the two. What's also interesting is the line below it, the one with the output. Uh, if you remember the clone git class, it sets the output in the run phase. But here we are still in plan. And we are taking its output, taking a value which lives under a certain specific key, and we are passing it forward to other actions. The thing here is that at this moment, the output is not the actual output, it's a reference to a future output which will eventually be there. So we can pass only a subset of the action's output to another action, and once we get to the run phase, it will all start fitting together. Like now we're just passing the reference around, and when it turns over to run, there will be the actual values. So this is how a simple CI pipeline could look. Uh, we take a URL, we clone it somewhere, we clone the repository somewhere, we go there, we install the dependencies, then we concurrently run tests and run the linting. Uh, you may want to run them you know, in sequence, but this is just to demonstrate how Dynflow can handle the concurrency. And in the end, we plan the build docker action to actually build the docker image. 
Do you want to see this live or can I move on? I'll keep going and if you have time then we will take a look at it. Basically I would just have to copy and paste from the slides and it should just work. Should. <clears throat> uh, another thing that is quite common are rescue strategies. There are three options for those <coughs> and that is pause, skip and fail. Uh, rescue strategies are basically a way of telling Dimeflow what to do with a specific step if it fails. The default is pause, so that means there was a step, it failed, we don't know what to do with it, but it's important, so we just stop at this place and we will wait for the user to resolve it. And the entire execution comes to a stop and waits until the user fixes it and resumes the stop. Next there is skip which is basically a way of saying, okay, this, is step, this step is not really all that important, so if it failed, we don't really care, and we just mark it as skipped, go over it, and continue. And then there's failed, and that is uh, embracing the let it crash. So if there was an exception within the step, we just failed hard, we stopped the execution plan, and we don't give the user any option to resume it or try to fix it. It's stopped, it's done, it's finished. Uh, those two can be overridden by defining the rescue strategy for self and rescue strategy methods on the action. The strategy for self says, okay, I as an action, if I fail, I can be skipped. And then if this action is planned as a child of other action, the other action can take this into consideration when deciding what to do. Alternatively, you can define the rescue strategy and it will say, okay, I say we want to do this and I don't care what my child actions want to do. So it will override the decision. Another quite common pattern is suspending. Because when steps are running, they are keeping the workers busy. Uh, I can actually show you that. I will quickly define a uh, busy class, which inside of its run method, it will block for 60 seconds. And then I create 25 of them. Okay, we can see they got planned. And if I switch over to the Danflow console, I can see they are all running, pending, but if I go to the status and load execution item counts, I can see that there are no free workers and that there are 20 items which are waiting to be executed. That is because you can define the number of workers you want Dimeflow to have and these are threads, but if you keep them busy, they are busy and they can't do anything else. That's why we have suspending. If you just want to inject a delay into the pipeline, I don't know why, uh, you can suspend the steps. You can say, okay, I as a step am running and I want to suspend. And then the suspended step can be awakened by sending them events. Uh, they can be sent by external processes. They can be sent by internal clock. So you can have an, well, an action which says, okay, I will sleep for a minute and then wake me up. This is the example. Then the run method actually accepts a single argument and by default it's nil. And what all this action would do is it would start running, it would go to sleep, but before it went to sleep it would schedule, it would set up a clock to wake itself up in 10 seconds. And this way you could inject the delay without blocking the workers. Now, if we had this, we're just a step away from polling. Dimeflow actually includes a module for doing easy polling. It's a wrapper which leverages suspending events and clock. And it's defined in the Dimeflow action polling module. And all you need to do is define those three methods. The first one is invoke external task, which is used for, you know, 
kicking off the thing you are waiting for. And then Dimeflow will call the poll external task for you. And what you do in there, it's up to you. For example, when we did this, we used invoke external task to call to the external service. Then we used poll external task to ask the external service, hey, what's the status? And then there's the done method, which actually takes the data from poll external task. It's handled by you. The done method should not do additional polling. And it's used to determine if we are done or not, and if we should keep polling more or not. Uh, there are several methods additional that you can define, which will fine tune the behavior of this. You can override the interval in which it polls. You can uh, limit the number of polls and everything. Then another pattern is cancelling. It's included in the action cancelable module. And what it allows the user is to go to the web UI and cancel a step which is suspended. So we usually use it with polling actions and so on. So if it is polling and you know it you know, it's never going to finish, for example, then you can go into the UI and say, okay, let's cancel this, let's abort. Uh, you need to define the cancel method. This, that's, that's the thing which gets executed when actually user clicks the cancel button. And inside run, you can't override it completely. You have to use super somewhere in there to actually go one level up to the cancelable module which handles the cancelling. And the last piece are subplans, which are useful for a matrix-like usage. So let's say we had a class which would run a CI pipeline, and then we would have a CI matrix, which would run this pipeline with, I don't know, different databases or something. And again, all you have to do is include this module and define the create subplans method. This method should return an array of uh, execution plans. And that's exactly what we are doing here. We're taking the databases from the input and for each one we trigger a CI pipeline job. Now, those were the things which would probably use if we were to start using Dimeflow right now because it solves a problem for you. But Dimeflow can do many different things, which are some of which are more advanced. For example, Dimeflow can do, with Dimeflow you can do a publish subscribe kind of like usage using subscriptions. So you can say plan this action when another action is planned and Dimeflow will do that for you. Dimeflow can do execution plan hooks, so when the entire execution plan turns over to stopped, paused, or something, you can run a code. It can do future execution. You can say, hey, let's run this action for me in, I don't know, 12 days. Why not? It can do singleton actions, which means there can be only one running instance of them. It can do subplans in batches, but that's uh, if you're having a lot of subplans and you need better performance. And there's actually a proof of concept branch on GitHub, which implements a rollback res uh, rescue strategy, which allows you, well, to roll back in case the execution plan hits an error. Now quickly about the deployment. Uh, inside the Dimeflow executor, there are several things. It's a single process which has uh, a clock, it has orchestrator which tells the workers what they should do, which step they should be working on, the orchestrator has some local state, there are some queues and the workers are actually consuming the work items from the queues. Uh, there is a client, in this case foreman, and it communicates with the executor through Postgres. We can also do split deployment, which is a new thing. It in Foreman, it's in Nightly currently, and that's where we split the orchestrator into multiple processes and we edit Redis into the mix. So the queues are now living in Redis <coughs> and it should scale better and be more performant. And of course, it allows us to scale the workers independently on the rest, so you can just add more instances and this image could grow probably 
almost infinitely. Uh, we are almost out of time, so I will open this for questions and answers. I'm sorry about not del delivering on the live coding part because uh, there was a lot to go over. Uh, let's give Adam a huge round of applause, please. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you.